If you have your Bible, I want you to actually find two passages, Luke chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 1. Um, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was a, a poet and an author, and he's actually responsible for writing the poetry or the poem that really gave the lyrics to a very famous Christmas song called, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Now, the carol, when it was first written, was written as a poem, and it was called Christmas Bells, and he actually wrote it during the start of the Civil War. But I want to tell you a little bit about his story. Um, when, he, when he wrote it, it was in, the country was in the, uh, steeped in Civil War. Uh, Henry had married a, a woman named Frances Appleton on July 13th of 1843, and they were blessed with a child named Charles about a year later, and ultimately they would have five kids. But tragedy struck both the Longfellow home and the nation in 1861 as the Civil War began. And Francis, while melting sealing wax for a document to seal it up, uh, actually caught her clothes on fire and began to burn. And Henry uh, ran over to her, tried to put a rug on her to, put, to douse the flames. And when he couldn't, he actually wrapped her up uh, in his arms and got burns all over his body. And she ended up dying the next day. In fact, the burns to his chest and to his neck are the reason that he would later in life grow out the beard and keep it long so that it would hide some of the scars of that. The first Christmas after Fanny's death, he wrote, quote, how inexpressibly sad are all the holidays. A year after the incident, he wrote, I can make no record of these days. Better leave them wrapped in silence. Perhaps someday God will give me peace. And Longfellow's journal entry on December 25th of 1862 reads, A Merry Christmas, say the children, but that is no more for me. Almost a year later after that entry, he received word that his oldest son, Charles, who was a lieutenant in the army, um, was, was severely wounded. And on Christmas Day in 1864, he penned the words to that poem that eventually would be reworked by a man named John Baptiste Calkin, and it, the first or two of the stanzas of that song or that poem read like this. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And if you've ever experienced tragedy or loss or moments of despair, then you can understand why he would write those words, can't you? Sometimes when we look around the world that we live in and we see all the chaos and the difficulty and the struggle and the war and the fighting and the political dissension and, and abortion, we look at murder, we look at all the things that, that happen all around us all the time, sometimes we can hang our head in despair and say there, there is no peace on earth. And yet that is the message that the angels gave on that first Christmas that we've been studying the last few weeks. When we lose a loved one, we don't immediately think peace on earth, goodwill to men, do we? When your boss comes in and you lose a job, your first thought is not peace on earth, goodwill toward men. When you're struggling with your family member and you got to get together for Christmas time and you have those awkward moments where you're mad or you're upset, you're not thinking in that moment of the message of Christmas of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Later in the poem, and we're going to read it at the end of the message today, we find that Henry Wadsworth Longfellow did find peace with God. And when we look at the first Christmas, the first Christmas actually did not start with peace and joy. In fact, as you see the story unfold, you will find that there was a lot of uncertainty and there was a lot of fear and even despair. And I want to look at that this morning, beginning in Luke chapter 1. And I want to begin in verse 26. And Luke's gospel records this. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So Mary and Joseph are betrothed. Now, we don't, in our culture, have an equivalent. Betrothed, betrothal was not like people try to make the, the, the uh, comparison to engagement, 
or your promise to be married to someone. But that's actually not quite substantial enough. A betrothal was essentially that a man and woman were not only pledged to be married, but they were legally married. They had just not physically consummated the relationship. And so, in fact, when you look later in the gospel narratives, you'll find that, uh, that in order to break a betrothal, unlike an engagement, if you break an engagement, you just give the ring back. If not, you go on Judge Judy and you can sue him for it. Uh, which I, you guys, some of you don't know this, but I, I'm a huge Judge Judy fan. Anybody else? I mean, I DVR Judge Judy. It's unbelievable that, that I do that, but, it, but it's true. If, if you break off an engagement and they don't give you the ring back, you can sue them for the ring. Just to let you know, that's, a, that's just free legal advice this morning. Um, so uh, anyway, but, but a betrothal to actually end that, you had to essentially divorce the person that you were betrothed to. And so here you have Mary and Joseph, they're in this, this binding arrangement, and I want you to look in verse 28, and the angel said to her, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. When I was a kid, we lived in a two-story house, and we didn't have uh, the rails like many houses have today, the walls to the upstairs where my room was, they were all solid. And so for my parents to get, you know, our attention, because often we'd have the TV or the stereo playing too loud, they would either have to bang on the ceiling or my dad would have to, in his booming voice, yell our name, Robbie. And when my dad would yell my name, you didn't know what kind of greeting this would be. You didn't know if it was, hey, Robbie, I just need you to go take the trash out or Robbie, come downstairs. But before you do, give your heart to God because your rear end is mine. That's what he used to tell me. Give your heart to God because your rear end's mine. You knew you were in trouble if dad had that voice. And so when dad would call our name from, from downstairs to upstairs, you would wonder like, okay, what's going on here? And that's what happened here. An angel appears to Mary and says, greeting, O favored one. And she's troubled in, in verse 29 because she can't figure out what kind of message this is. And if you're Mary, you could understand that. Is this one of these greetings of, of the Old Testament where God was going to pronounce judgment on someone? Is this a moment where God is going to come and, and discipline me or have I done something wrong and God is going to speak judgment over me? And verse 29 says that she was greatly troubled at the message of the angel. And when people think about Christmas, sometimes we are greatly troubled. Some are greatly troubled because they're walking through difficulty. Sometimes people are greatly troubled because they believe that the story of Christmas, as I said last week, is just a fairy tale. It's just a made-up story. The birth of Jesus as born to a virgin, born as a son of God, to them, they're greatly troubled because they don't believe the message. Some people are greatly troubled at the story of Christmas because they believe the truth about Jesus being born of a virgin, but they know that their relationship with God is not right. And so Mary was greatly troubled because she couldn't figure out what this message was. But I wonder for us today if some of us might be greatly troubled at the Christmas message or greatly troubled during this Christmas season. Some in our church have just found out they've lost jobs. Last night, Stephen and Vivian Thompson, and by the way, I just want to share this blessing. They shared last night that as they were on a mission trip down to Costa Rica, they had taken all these gifts for the kids down there that they were going to be ministering to in sports camps. And they were going to share the gospel with them and, and share gifts with them that they had collected. And at the airport, the security has basically taken all of those gifts, and now they have them in custody, and it's going to be very expensive to get them out. And, and Vivian and Stephen, if you don't know them, amazing people. Stephen works full-time as a missionary uh, in Destiny Sports Missions, and I, I texted the elders last night, and I just want you to know, church, and I'm going to let Stephen know this later, that our church is going to send money to Stephen and Vivian today in order to help them get those gifts out of custody so they can take those gifts to those kids and then, uh, and then share the gospel with them. And that's only possible because you faithfully give. And so, church, I want you to know that. We're going to talk to Stephen later, figure that out. We've also talked to some people on the ground. But when, when they posted last night, they were greatly troubled at what they were going through. And the joy that they were looking forward to of sharing these gifts with these kids has now been taken away because they received a message that wasn't exactly what they wanted to hear. But I love verse 30. Because in verse 29, Mary is greatly troubled. But notice what God says to her through the messenger in verse 30. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. There's two things I love about that verse, and I hope that these will speak to you today. 
is that when God spoke to Mary, he called her by name. Not greeting, oh, general person in the public, but God knew her name. But the first thing he said to her was, do not be afraid. When your boss comes in and tells you you've lost your job, you can't help in that moment but feel fear, can you? How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to afford to get food on the table? How am I going to buy Christmas gifts for my family? When the doctor comes in and gives you a bad diagnosis, you can't help but in that moment feel fear. What does this mean for me? Am I going to make it? Am I going to survive? Am I going to have the resources to pay for the treatment? I mean, there are moments in our lives that fill us with great fear. And in those moments, I want you to know that God knows your name and God says to all of us, do not be afraid. In Isaiah chapter 41, God told Isaiah, do not be afraid. Fear not because I'm with you. To Joshua, who was facing the Jordan River and crossing that and, and facing new leadership and leading the people of God after years of wandering, he was scared about what God had called him to do, but God said to him, do not be afraid for I'm with you wherever you go. The disciples, when they were on the boat and there was a storm and they were, they were in fear of the storm, Jesus came walking on the water and what did he say? It's me, do not be afraid. And I want you to know today that if you're greatly troubled about something this Christmas, I want you to know that God knows your name and God wants you to know that you should not be afraid. David wrote in Psalm 34, he said that, that he would not be worried because he had called unto God. He sought the Lord and he answered me and God delivered me from all of my fears. And in that moment when God spoke to Mary, he said, do not be afraid. And after God told Mary that, notice what he said next in verse 31. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. What's interesting in that verse, one of the interesting things, is that Mary didn't get to choose the name of her child. God did. And do you know why that is? Because it was God's son. You will conceive in your womb and you will bear a son and you will call his name Jehovah saves. In the name of Jesus, we find God's purpose and God's plan for the world. And I want you to write this down. Jesus is the hope of Christmas. If the Brook Church aspires to be real people finding real hope in the real world, we need to understand that real hope in the real world is Jesus has been born as the Savior of the world. Jesus is the hope of Christmas. And so after God told Mary, don't be afraid, he reminded her, you're going to have a son, and that son is going to be named Jehovah Saves. And look down to verse 34. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child that will be born to you will be called Holy, the Son of God. Jesus was God in the flesh, born of a woman, so he was fully man, and born of the Holy Spirit, so he was fully God. And theologians have wrestled with that idea, how could he have been fully God and fully man, and we won't fully understand that, I don't believe, until we see him face to face and we're changed to be like him. But I want you to know that when Jesus was born, he was born as the Son of God, and he was born as the Savior of the world, fully human, the second Adam. Jesus is the hope of Christmas. And we find that in Luke chapter 1, a story of fear turning to joy and peace because the Savior would be born. Now take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 1. I want to now look at the story of Joseph when that first Christmas was announced to him. But if you look in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, there's going to be a summary of everything that we just read out of Luke chapter 1. So let's look at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. So that's a summary of everything we just read from Luke 1, right? You hear it all in there. Found with child of the Holy Spirit. They were betrothed before they came together. She was found to, have, uh, uh, to be pregnant with this child. And then look at the last phrase of verse 18. 
She was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, when we read that on this side of Christmas, we look at that statement with great joy because we look and we say, a virgin conceived and gave birth to a son, and his name is Jesus. And we sing songs like Silent Night, Round Yon Virgin, Mother and Child, right? We see that today, and we see it with great joy. But the fact that Mary was pregnant and Joseph and Mary were not married was scandalous in that culture. And it was anything but peaceful for them. In fact, if you look in the verses that follow, you'll find that Mary and Joseph were struggling. Mary had undoubtedly told Joseph what had happened in Luke chapter 1. An angel appeared to me, Joseph, told me that I'm going to have a baby, and the baby inside of me is the Son of God. You think back to when you were dating, or you were engaged, and the person you're engaged to says, listen, I'm pregnant, and the baby is God's. How many of you would believe that? Joseph didn't. Joseph was struggling with the announcement of the first Christmas. In fact, look at verse 19. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. It doesn't say that Joseph was jumping for joy over the fact that his, his betrothed wife was pregnant with a child that wasn't his. It doesn't say that Joseph believed what Mary told him about this child. No, Joseph was struggling. Joseph's world was falling apart. He's about to divorce the woman that he has pledged his life to, that he's entered into an agreement with to be married for the rest of his life. He's already told his family about him and Mary. And now all of a sudden, imagine having to tell his family, Mary's pregnant, she's starting to show, and the baby's not mine, but the baby belongs to God. I mean, Joseph can't handle it. And so in verse 19, you see that Joseph is, is going to put her away privately. This would have been scandalous. This would have made the Mari Povich show. And I don't make light of that. But if you've ever seen that, it's a terrible show, by the way. It's so dumb. And it's gotten dumber through the years, and it's just an indication of our culture. Don't get me started on that. But anyway, the big thing about Mari Povich was that the, you know, they bring the man, the woman on stage. She's pregnant, right? They do the paternity test, and then they reveal, and what do they say? You are not the father. And everybody in the crowd, oh, right? They're cheering it on. I mean, it's so dumb, so ridiculous. But that's what the whole show has turned into, these paternity tests. But you see when these, when these people, and some of them I think are actors, but you see them on the stage and the, the guy thinks I am the father and then they reveal he's not the father, there's embarrassment, right? They run off the stage. People make fun of them. In fact, some of the language of Scripture when some of the Pharisees would talk to Jesus about his father, they would say, we know who our father is. We're not born of adultery or fornication. And so there was a lot of scandal involved in, in this, culturally, that Joseph and Mary are not married, they've not consummated their marriage, and yet she is pregnant. So there's a cloud of shame and hurt, and Joseph, being a good man, resolves that the best solution for our family is for us to end this and let Mary go her own way, and I'll go my own way, and Mary and her son, which she says is the Son of God, can go on their way and have another family. And all of this was swirling around in the head of Joseph at that first Christmas. Can you imagine how he felt? Just try to put yourself in his sandals for a moment. It would have been incredibly difficult for Joseph to really wrap his mind around this. We understand it on this side because we see the end result that the baby was born and he was the savior of the world and Jesus would live a perfect life and die on the cross and then was buried and rose again. We see it with clear understanding, but in this moment, Joseph doesn't understand. But if you look at the next verse, verse 20, you'll see that, but as he considered these things, the King James Version says, as he thought on these things. What I want you to know is that the message of Christmas was not initially one of joy and peace. It was despair and Joseph, in verse 20, is consumed with it. He's thinking about this all the time. What am I going to do? How am I going to make this work? So as he considered these things, verse 20, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, and listen to the similarity between what God said to Joseph and what God had said to Mary. Listen for it. He said, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, 
For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad that God knows you by name and God is with you so you don't have to be afraid? Even in the most difficult, despair-filled moments, God knows your name and God is with you. He says to Joseph, Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary to be your wife. The same message, and then in verse 21, if you want the gospel and the joy of Christmas in one verse, learn and memorize Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Think about the theological truths in that verse. She will bear a son. He's human. You would call his name Jesus, which reveals God's purpose in the birth of Jesus. Jehovah saves. And he will save his people from their sins. Not religion will save people from their sins. Not the church will save people from their sins. Jesus will save people from their sins. He will save them. That's why Jesus is the hope of Christmas. And that's the message that needs to be heralded in our lives and in our church. Christmas has become a lot of things to a lot of people. And not all of those things are bad. Giving gifts and and traveling to see your family and having time off from work and the lights and all that. Those things in and of themselves are not bad. But they are not what Christmas is about. Christmas is about he who came to save people from their sins. And remember our definition of joy in the first message in this series. I want to read it off the screen. It says that Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the word and in the world. And I've said to you through this series that fullness of joy is found where? Fullness of joy is found in Jesus Fullness of joy that our hearts are longing for is found in Jesus. Look in Matthew 1, 21 again. He will save his people from their sins. Fullness of joy is found in him. He who came to save us from our sins. And if you're struggling with joy today because of loss, there will be some in our church, maybe some gathered in this room who will, who will not experience joy this Christmas because there's an empty seat at your table, I want you to know that God knows you by name and he's with you. But Joseph, who was struggling for joy in that first Christmas, received the word from God and he did three things. And I want to encourage you today to take these three things if you want to experience joy and do what he did. We see in Matthew 20, uh, excuse me, verse 1 and verse 22, And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Jesus. I said to you last week, the entire message was built around this idea that the joy of Christmas is found in the fact that the promises of God are true. Isaiah prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus that a virgin would conceive and bear a son. And it's perfectly summarized there in verse 23. Jesus is the hope of Christmas. But I want you to look at that last phrase of verse 23 because Matthew inserts a parenthetical interpretation. Isaiah had prophesied that this Savior would be born of a virgin and when he would come, his name would be Emmanuel. And when Matthew quotes that, look at the end of verse 23, which means God with us. Isn't that good to know? That God is with us. When Jesus was born, God was not just in heaven. God is with us. And his name would be Emmanuel, a Hebrew word, which means God with us. In Matthew's gospel, he puts that in there as a reminder of why Jesus came. Jesus came to be with us so that we didn't have to be afraid. Jesus is the hope of Christmas, and Jesus is God with us. So God with us is the hope of Christmas. It's where we find joy in Christmas, knowing that God is with us today. And in his message to Joseph, God was simply telling him, you're not alone. 
I'm here for you, and I'll provide a way for your salvation. I want you to take this today. Find joy in the knowledge that God is with you. Even at times in our lives when it doesn't feel that way, God is with us. Let God speak that to you today. God is with you. And notice in verse 24, here's what Joseph did. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Here are three things that Joseph did. I want to encourage you with them today. Number one, when you're not feeling joy, believe that God is working. Sometimes we lose sight of joy in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our despair, because we forget that God is working. There's a lot of faith between verse 24 and verse 25. In verse 24, Joseph woke from sleep and he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and he took his wife. And then there's a pause, there's, there's a time between the promise of God and the fulfillment of God in verse 25. He did what God said even though the promise had not yet come true. Do you see it? So in that moment, Joseph believed that God was working God can work in the loss of a loved one. God can, lo can work in the loss of a job. God can work in the midst of your family struggle. We have to, in those moments, find joy in believing that God is working. Number two, hold on to the promises of God. This is where the enemy attacks our joy. Is in the midst of our struggle, he will tell us, God's not with you. God doesn't hear you. God doesn't see you. God doesn't know your struggle. I want you to know that's a lie of the enemy. He knows your name, and God is always with you. And in those moments of despair and trouble, we have to hold on to the promises of God. You think between verse 24 and verse 25, Joseph had some fear? Is this really true? Do you think Joseph had some doubts? Is God really going to do what he said he's doing? You think he wasn't aware of the whispers of the doubters? Yeah, did you hear what Joseph said about Mary? You think Joseph didn't feel struggle in the midst of that, but in the midst of all of that, he held on to the promises of God. Joseph was there. Look, verse 24 and verse 25. From the moment God declared to him that this is what Christmas was all about, that Mary was going to give birth to the Savior of the world, from that moment forward, Joseph obeyed God and he did everything that God said for him to do and he held on to the word of God which are the promises of God. You see it? Hold on to the promises of God. And then let me say one more. Joseph served. And I want to encourage you in the midst of your struggle for joy, serve others. One of the best ways to overcome depression and I'm not going to try to clinically diagnose anything here. But one of the things that when you read about depression that happens is it's very cyclical. And what depression can do is, is trap you in a mindset that you're alone. And then you sit by yourself and you sit with your thoughts and then it just continues to cycle and it isolates you. And one of the best ways to combat that is to realize that God has a purpose for your life and that you can do something to bless other people. Joseph receives this news that is hard for him, and he's considering divorce. He's considering sending his wife away. But after he received a word from the Lord, he did exactly what God said. And then you look in those verses, and it's implied not only here, but also in Luke chapter 2, that every single step of the journey from Nazareth down to Bethlehem, Joseph was there with Mary, serving her needs, being there for her. One of the greatest ways to find joy in the Christmas season is to do something for someone else. And it doesn't have to cost money. Sometimes the thing you can do can be pulling out your phone and sending a text and saying, hey, I just want you to know that God brought you to my heart today and I'm praying for you. Doing good for someone and serving someone could be that if you know someone that's sitting with an empty chair at the dinner table this Christmas season, invite them to go to coffee. Invite them to go and just talk and kind of get their mind off of the loss that they've experienced. Sometimes the way that we can bring joy not only to others but to ourselves is by serving other people. Joseph in the story of Christmas was simply present with Mary 
every step of the way. Because can you imagine how difficult it was for Mary to tell that story and to expect people to believe it? But knowing that she had Joseph there by her side every step of, step of the way brought joy to the family. So do you need joy today? Just a couple things. Fullness of joy is found in Jesus. And if you're struggling with joy then I want you to know that maybe the first place you start today is to find your joy in him. Some of you maybe have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ that a Savior was born that day. This Christmas, you can find fullness of joy by finding Jesus in your heart. Right where you're sitting today, would you just simply place your faith in what Jesus Christ did for you, that he was born to be the Savior of the world, and he lived and died, was buried and rose again for your sins. And that's how we find fullness of joy. But if you've already found Jesus and you are a believer, I want to encourage you to do what Joseph did. Believe in the midst of your struggle that God is working. And in the midst of that struggle, hold on to the promises of God. Know that God is with you. Know that God knows your name and that God will never leave you or forsake you. And then find a way to serve others. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote that beautiful hymn, a poem, but it became a beautiful hymn that we sing at Christmas time. And I just want to read the lyrics of the five stanzas of that poem. And I want you to hear how Henry Wadsworth Longfellow described the peace and joy of Christmas. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. And wild and sweet, the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. I thought how, as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. Did you hear the turn there? And he ends it with this, till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. His night turned to day, right? Because he was convinced God's not dead. He's with me. He sees me. He knows my name, and I can find joy and peace in him. And I pray that that same joy and peace will be what you experience this Christmas.